have grace for each other, have empathy, and just pause. My therapist was like, don't make any major life decisions within the first year of a catastrophe and to just really sit in it. And you'll see, like my therapist always said, like, you'll see what it's going to be. Like in this next year, you'll see if he's going to really try to work it out. You're going to see if you're going to be able to do it and just watch. And it's, it's interesting when you just sit there and watch. Country music singer and actress Janet Kramer is with me today, along with Michael Cousin, her husband and uh, former great NFL player. They are here to uh, talk about their new book, which is called The Good Fight, Wanting to Leave, Choosing to Stay, and the Powerful Practice of Loving Faithfully. And it is full of tools to help you really navigate your relationship. Now, these two they have been through a lot. They have lived through a lot. They got to the other side. Uh, they had to deal with these issues such as infidelity, and they got to the other side. And so you're going to find really very, very useful tools here on how you can possibly get through the uh, challenges your relationship is facing right now. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Jana, of course, she is a, uh, an award-winning country artist. She's uh, put out a couple of great albums, and she has a new EP coming within uh, months. She's also starred in the TV series uh, One Tree Hill, Friday Night Lights. Remember when she was on Dancing with the Stars a few years back? Yep, I sure do. You know, recently she just did a Lifetime movie. She starred in that. She's a pistol. I'll tell you, she's a she's an entrepreneur. She is full of ideas, and uh, she's the uh, spark plug, I'll tell you. And so you're, you're going to really enjoy uh, Jana. And her, her husband, Mike... I really enjoyed having him here. I, you know, I did not really know him before, but I feel like uh, I feel like we're good buddies now, which is crazy. I never feel that way after having somebody here the first time for you know an hour. He was just a good hang. He just put it out there, and uh, he he fessed up to some of the things that uh, he's put their marriage through and put Jana through, and then talked about how he and she got through it. They're going to go into details, by the way. I'm not going to go into a lot here, but they're very candid. Uh, they really open the book and, and let you right in. And uh, you're, you're just going to get a lot from it. By the way, check out their podcast as well. It's called The Wine Down, W-H-I-N-E Down, not wine, like the like the alcoholic beverage, not wine down and not, oh uh, gosh, not... Uh, wind down it's wine w-h-i-n-e down it is really fun to listen to and i know there are a lot of podcasts out there and you have to make a choice all the time on which one to listen to and or not but this is one that i am personally recommending uh, because it is so authentic you'll thoroughly enjoy it so let's get to my uh, interview that i just did with Jana kramer and michael cousin Hey guys, welcome. Thank Hi. you, David, for having us. Thank oh, you. Oh my gosh. First of all, you, uh, let me congratulate you on having a New York Times bestseller. <laughs> Isn't that you. weird? It's yeah, so weird. Very strange. <laughs> Did you think when you started this that you'd end up on the uh, New York Times bestseller list? You know, I set our goals pretty high for this, but it's still one of those things. You, you, you know, we were reaching for the stars. We're like, uh, let's hope for it and pray for it but who knows if it's going to happen so it's still surreal yeah i honestly when he was saying that i was like hey babe like i need you to like set your expectations a little <laughs> bit lower i'm like it's a great dream to have but i'm like i just it's really hard to to do it so um i'm like this is gonna be tough but, i mean we had a great i mean obviously my instagram followers are insane and then you know with the marketing team that we had and publicists and stuff with everyone sharing and buying like it was it was crazy what really got to me is first of all you really put yourselves out there. I mean, was that a tough decision? And what was the process like in, in doing that? Putting yourself out there and being so vulnerable. You know, it was one of those things that Jana saw the light at the other end of the tunnel in this process before I did. You know, she, you know, she's always been one of those that heals through sharing and heals through discussing it with other people. So she doesn't feel alone and they can just kind of, you know, join in empathy with one another and understanding. And for me, I had so much shame at the beginning and still do on things that it took me a long time to kind of see that potential light. And it wasn't until we started our, you know, our podcast that 
we started to get feedback and, and you know people validating that they appreciated appreciated us being so open um and then i kind of looked at my wife it's like hey surprise you're right like <laughs> we can do something with this so but it was it was difficult at times still yeah i mean it's obviously hard to open up wounds and um in some tough times but i think at the end of the day knowing the amount of people that we've been able to help and um make laugh and cry and just have an experience with is far um greater than the than the stuff that was hard to come up the uh the format of the book is a uh, kind of interesting why don't you talk about that and how you came up with that i was really adamant about having it be from both of our voices and i even have an email from our early on from our editor who was like no i just want it to be like a wee voice and i was just like i really really want to fight for both of us having our own voices because we experience situations so much differently than than the other person so um, and I think once we started writing the book and we kind of, we did the we voice, but then I was like, yeah, but I kind of want to tell this story. Then he, you know, he was telling his story. I think the editor saw the importance of that and then realizing, oh, wow, this is, this is important that each person has a voice and it's told from our own voices. Yeah. And for us, it was, you know, because we didn't hire a ghostwriter, like we wrote this ourselves, just in, locked in our office, you know, typing away. And so to share this kind of information, like you talked about that we're so open that can't get lost in translation through anybody else. That had to come directly from us to the paper. So, you know, it was important that we kind of stood our ground on that. And, you know, thankfully our editor and everyone on board and like realized what we were doing and we're all about it. Mm -hmm. What was the toughest chapter to write and why? Tell me a story. Um, I think prey on it was really tough for me just because I've always had issues with my higher power and, um, you know, wondering if he's going to be there for me or not and abandon me. Um, and so that was a really, really tough one, especially because when Mike had relapsed again, that's when I found out that I was pregnant with our second child. And so I think that one was just really hard to just kind of bring up those feelings and emotions behind that. Um, and then, you know, but at the end of the day, it was just trusting in God that, um, you know, I could put my faith in him and, you know, he'll, he'll make the, the path straight and it's already all planned out. So I'm just <laughs> along <laughs> for the ride. Along for the ride. Yeah. Pray on it was tough. Um, we share that feeling around that chapter, but also to tell the truth was tough too. Um, that was a chapter that surprisingly we added later in the process. We're like, how did we not have this in there before? But some events had happened that really sparked us to have to put that chapter in. And for me personally, just as a man and wanting to be a man with integrity and live with integrity, it was difficult to admit that lying and being, you know, unfaithful has been a part of my entire past and history. You know, I, I like to think of myself as a man that lives with integrity, especially now, but to, to admit that and that throughout my life, I haven't been, it's tough because I didn't want people to look at me differently or think less of me. But it was important to admit that and to acknowledge that, hey, this is my character defect. I need to continue to do things even now to stay away from that. So that and pray on it were just vulnerable chapters for me personally, too. Help me go a little deeper here for me. Tell me the biggest challenge you've all faced in, in your marriage and how, how you've been able to overcome it. I mean, I think for, for us, for sure, infidelity has been like the hardest thing because that's always going to be there. It's always going to be a thread in our marriage. It's always going to come up, you know, and you know, for Mike, I think the hard, the hardest part has been empathy, um, even to this day where it's, you know, he's like, it's done. That's, you know, four years ago. I'm like, no, but it's, it's always going to be in our marriage. It's always going to be there. Um, and so just to have that empathy and realizing, you know, what happened in our marriage and, you know, how to continue to be empathetic and lean in and, um, and understand that unfortunately his behaviors have, you know, turn this relationship into something we didn't want it to be, but hopefully in the end we can be stronger because of it. But that's definitely the hardest. Yeah. I mean, and along with that just comes from, just comes the whole topic of honesty of whether it, the infidelity piece or just the, the smallest things, honesty is something that I'm trying to get back in, in, into our marriage and trust. And that's just, everyone knows that's the hardest thing to repair in any relationship that you have, whether romantic or not. Um, so, you know, I'm continuously trying to do that and that's just, it's hard to do. And it's as a man and as a person in general, it's hard to not be trusted. It's hard to not be given the benefit of the doubt, even on the smallest of things. Um, so that's one of those things that is a, a daily struggle for both of us is me being receptive to that, Jana being willing to trust. And it's, so it's, 
that continues to, to, you know, tarnish our relationship a little bit, but we're just continuing to work our way through. And that's the thing is at the end of the day, like we wrote this book is as long as we're both showing up to fight, like we're going to keep doing that. And that's where we're at. So for folks going through something similar right now, what advice can you give them to just help them get to the other side of this as opposed to throwing in the towel? Go to therapy. We're huge advocates for therapy. Um, we wouldn't have been able to do this by ourselves without any guidance from therapists to help us, you know, garner the tools that we needed to just kind of put, put one foot in front of the other. Um, have grace um, for each other, have empathy and just pause. Uh, my therapist was like, don't make any major life decisions within the first year of a catastrophe um, and to just really sit in it. Um, and you'll see, like my therapist always said, like, you'll see what it's going to be like in this next year, you'll see if he's going to really try to work it out. You're going to see if you're going to be able to do it and just watch. And it's, it's interesting when you just sit there and watch. Yeah. It's easy to let your head to start making up stories and just realizing it's may seem easier, but it's also difficult too, just to walk away. Right. There's, there's pains that go along with that. But for us, it is like Jan is saying, just pause and it's it's slow and steady. Like you're not going to have the answer right away. And there's some people that it's that much of a deal breaker. It's black and white for them. Infidelity happened. I'm out. And that's fine, too. We don't we don't question people like that. If you know, you know. Um, but for those people that are on the fence and don't know, there's no harm in giving it time. You know, so it's all part of a higher of a greater plan. And, and so for us, that was our path, just continuing to show up each day the best that we could as long as you're able to acknowledge that the other person, your partner in life is working as well, then you can continue to do it together. I can certainly relate to that. I, I know for myself, uh, oh gosh, I got divorced more than 10 years ago. What, 12? Well, actually it's 14 years ago. I got separated. Then uh, of course I lived in California. It took four years to get the divorce, but <laughs> I should have gone to therapy years ago. And you know what? This pandemic gave me nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> I've done over 200 hours of therapy this year. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Great time to and do I, it. And I should have done it a decade ago. And by but the way- at least I, you did it. That's the thing. Yeah. There's a lot of people, I mean, where it's just, you know, I wish my grandparents did it a long time ago, mm -hmm. you know, but at mm -hmm. least you did it. And now you're going to be able to, you know, I don't know your situation now, but I don't know if you'll, you know, you can, you can just, you're working on yourself. It's going to help every relationship work wise, relationally. So it's good. My, my situation now is that I live in a big house with a cat. <laughs> well, all you cat ladies out there, meow, someone's on the prowl. <laughs> now, y y you guys have to help me out here because, yeah, yeah, you've got this great book out, but uh, first of all, your podcast. Mm -hmm. I'd started listening to your podcast way before I looked at and read the book, okay? And that's where I thought, first of all, y you really open yourselves up. <laughs> yeah we do yeah i have a lot of people are like can you just stop bringing your relationship issues because i'm sick of defending you guys because you know a lot of people that listen to it or like first timers like oh this is so toxic but i mean there's always we just talk about our stuff and some may think it is toxic and you know it i, I get that but at the same time we've done the work too to be able to fix our issues and we're just bringing people along the ride and just showing like no marriage is perfect it's hard it's a really hard work so, but we, yes, we unfortunately put ourselves out there sometimes too much. First of all, how in the world did you decide to do the podcast and when did you decide to just put it all out there? Um, it was my podcast to begin with. Um, it was me and another lady and uh, Mike didn't want to talk about any of this stuff. So I was like, all right, that's, that's, you know, it's his prerogative. He wants to just like sleep it under the rug. It's fine. But I've, I've kind of, I heal trauma with um, trying to help others because it makes me feel a little less alone. So he came on the podcast as a guest and I said, you can talk about whatever you want. If you want to go there, you can go there. If not, we can just talk about just surface stuff. And he ended up going there and he's like, wow, it's really powerful to talk behind a mic. And you just have this, um, you feel strong and empowered. And so he ended up seeing the responses that we got from that episode. And, um, and yeah, he was like, all right, can I be on this full time? <laughs> so he had to kick someone off the show to be full time, but you know, <laughs> it, it morphed into what it was supposed to be. And it was, you know, a relationally fun, but also challenging at time podcast. Mike, did, did you ever feel weird how she, I've seen a few times she kind of uh, goes for it and kind of puts you in a position. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, that <laughs> before the podcast, I mean, that was my life anyway. That's how Jana is. And I love that about her. And so, you know, I mean, if we ever talked about something that I wasn't, you know, ready to talk about or didn't want to in that moment, then good thing about podcasts, we can edit it or stop it or whatever. So it's not live. But the thing is, that's become kind of, I don't want to call it our brand because we're not trying to like benefit off of it, but that's become our story, right? Like our, our story and the things that happened in our marriage were outed against our will. Someone close to us sold the story to a you know magazine publication and the rest is history. So for us, it was just, you know, Jan was telling me, let's try to control the narrative and just, you know, not sweep it under the rug. So this goes along with it. And again, like Jan was saying, I feel empowered by the people that respond to it and the amount of men that have come up to me or, or contacted me and just been so appreciative of seeing a man being so open and vulnerable about these topics because it's difficult as a man in general to want to talk about these things. So that alone has shown me that what we're doing is, is the right thing and that, you know, this is part of God's plan for us. Then again, I can relate because ever since I, well, I was in California in January, February and started doing all this therapy and I kind of put it out there on Facebook and all of a sudden I had all these guys wanting to come over and meet with me on mm-hmm. the, you know, on the front porch. And uh, I, I, I just have to tell you, for anybody listening, there's nothing more powerful than telling your story because mm-hmm. it's, it's definitely going to touch someone. It, it, if you're vulnerable, mm-hmm. you're not making it up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, l- let me ask you, uh, first of all, how did you two meet? We met on Twitter. On yeah. Twitter? Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's real hard to meet people, especially like when I was always out touring and, you know, he was playing professional football at the time. And so it was just... That kind of seemed like the the way to meet people um, in our uh, lifestyle. So, so yeah. you're, you're telling me I have to up my game on Twitter? <laughs> yeah, no, no yeah. I, I'm not actually on Twitter. Like, no, you need to up your game, and maybe like in Facebook would be a good area for you. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Although my daughters tell me. Dad, Facebook is for really old people. No, they're for our parents. That's like now so it is, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so you guys met on Twitter. Mm-hmm. So so. Tell me what happened. Classic love story. Um, no, I started following Jana. I don't know what I saw that sparked my interest. And it was the off season for me. Um, started following her. And a few times after I favorited some things, got her attention. She followed me back. I slid her a message. Um, we talked for a couple of days. And like four days later after that, I was before I had to go to report to a training camp in Buffalo, she had a show in Chicago. So I flew to Chicago to meet her and the rest is pretty much history mm-hmm. oh that's a so sweet yeah so yeah. sweet it's been so happy ever since so yeah <laughs> <laughs> very blissful so you guys have all these different careers going on what about the music side music side um i'm writing soon um i have a song that i really like that i think i'm gonna put out in the first quarter um hopefully an ep that will follow um maybe a nice christmas album next year i don't know it's always little things but you know as far as like you know, really pushing the music. I'm, I'm doing it for me and the people that want to listen. So I don't have it in me anymore to play the games of radio and um, play all those shows with the two kids that I have. And I just want to put out music that I like and hopefully, you know, the people that follow me will like it too. The state of the music business has changed so radically over the, mm-hmm. over the years, right? Yeah. And now we see this complete movement to, or move to uh, streaming. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you guys really live in that world. In, sure. in, in, in the digital world, mm-hmm. right? So what is preventing you from um, hit, hitting one out of the park? Is it just finding the right song? Is that what it comes down to? I think to? it is. It's finding the right song, but also having, you know, I think I still think you need the right team behind you too. I think people, you know, that have, you know, labels and stuff, it's obviously the marketing is really helpful, and but that's a, it's a lot of money to, you know, mm-hmm produce a song and put it out there and have the right team behind you. So um, just kind of waiting for it. We'll see. You know, I deal with that all the time. It, 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 on our radio show, we're on some 300 stations mm-hmm. and uh, something will come across. And, and by the way, I don't claim to be the music guy. I do have a pretty good finger on the pulse. I mean, I'm probably one of the few people. I mean, I you know, all those late night compilations that used to be sold, they for still sure. are <laughs> overnight. Mm-hmm. I, I did a lot of those. So I'm one of the few people that have actually sold literally a, a couple hundred million dollars of music without being a, in the music business. Wow. Awesome. 
And, and many times I had to like pick and choose the songs that went on those compilations and then get them licensed. Mm -hmm. And many times they were, you know, what, what, what's the audience going to respond to? And especially in the contemporary Christian music market, you mm -hmm. know, that market is so small. It's only 4% of the market. When you're going out and buying major channels mm -hmm. like Lifetime and Bravo, and you, you have to reach out to everybody. And the other thing, by the way, just a little secret, when I originally launched the Keep the Faith collection 25 years ago on TV, which now is the number one multi-set box set in the business. That's awesome. Congrats. It, well, it did, it did like 25 million in sales. Mm -hmm. It, um, 92% uh, of the people had never bought Christian music before. Wow. And, um, we didn't buy one Christian station for the first five years. Mm -hmm. Right. But guess what? We didn't call it Christian music. We call it keep the faith, the quest for love, happiness, and purpose. Interesting. And we didn't even reveal it was Christian music until about 20 minutes into the show. And we had a little one line above the phone number that said the finest in Christian music. The reason I put that is so I wouldn't get sued by some attorney who said, you never told him. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the key is it's, it's about meeting the needs of people. It's about, you know, filling up their, their hearts and their souls. And, um, I bring that up because, you, you know, as you go forward and look at, you know, how to really break through that thing that's out there, that barrier, you know, my feeling is that you just meet the felt needs of, of people, mm -hmm. go for the felt needs and look at unique marketing experiences that go around the system. I mean, when we did Keep the Faith, I, yeah, I licensed the music from the record companies but um, they didn't choose the songs and they didn't position the thing on the air. Mm -hmm. And and we didn't call it whatever the genre was because it really didn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I and I, I think that uh, an artist such as yourself, you are just positioned perfectly for that sort of thing because you put yourself out there, you do tell your story and it's all about the story. Mm -hmm. And when you can combine the right song with the right story, the right real life story, I, I think, just amazing things can happen. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> <Your word. laughs> Would love that. But, you know, I'm just going to keep being a mom, doing my thing, and hopefully yeah. putting stuff out there people yeah. like. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, I, one more thing about the Keep the Faith collection back in the days. Mm -hmm. The number one market for sales was had nothing to do with a Bible Belt. It was San Francisco. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Pretty cool, huh? That awesome. is interesting. So tell me, as you look into the future and you see kind of where, uh, you know, first of all, we all we all hope to have a, a much better year in the year ahead than we've had this past year, right? <laughs> uh, tell me how this, getting through this pandemic and all this craziness, how it's changing the, the environment around you all, how you think the world's going to change uh, when, when do you think we're going to get back to some type of normal? I mean, I really don't know. I mean, everyone, it's kind of, you know, the, who knows when shows are going to come back, but I feel if rallies can come back, I think shows can come back, but that's just me. Um, but I, you know, I, I think a lot of people are going to be working from home now, you know, that's, they see that it can work. And personally, what I've noticed is that I can do a lot of stuff. Like we don't need to have the, the full-time nanny. Like we're able to, I'm able to do my work and still create and still dream and still be around the kids. And I, I've learned how to multi-manage a little bit better. So that's been really helpful for me and my work. Yeah, I think it's gonna be interesting just to see the ripple effect that this actually has, right? Like people thinking that 2020 has just been this awful year and once we're out of 2020, everything's gonna be great. But the ripple effect with entertainment, with sports, with, you know, workplaces. And like Jane was saying, like we might see a lot of vacant buildings because companies are going to realize they don't need to spend the overhead on these big office buildings when people can work from home. And, you know, so there's going to be a lot of things that move in parts over the next probably 12 to 18 months in all aspects of life. For us and our family, <clears throat> you know, we kind of got to the point where we were tired of we're still respecting the the CDC guidelines and everything that we had to do, but we we're tired of feeling like we we're living in this box. That's why we took the kids to Florida for, you know, a long weekend. That's why we went to <clears throat> to Mexico for 
for three nights just to get away because we just need that normalcy a little bit. We, you know, we're so used, so many people are used to traveling all the time. We just needed to get out and just do something different. And so I think going into this next year, it's all about how you approach it personally. You know, are you going to let the ripple effect affect you going into next year? Because I think it's ultimately our own personal choice on how much it affects us, you know? So you two are sort of masters at reinvention, right? (laughs) You've been able to pivot. Uh, You've been able to go from one career to another, to another. Uh, Tell me what that is like, because it's an art. You know, there are are a lot of people out there right now who are going through this, where they had a job, they don't have a job. Uh, Maybe, to some extent, whatever they did before doesn't even exist now. And this this happened like overnight, Mm -hmm. right? What are some of the uh, secrets to reinvention that you've all found? Because I know it's 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 a tough transition too. It is a tough transition, and for me personally, I've leaned on Jana a lot because she is an entrepreneur at heart. Like she's always creating, dreaming, thinking, doing something. Always has an email to write. Always, you know. And so, what I've learned from her is like if you throw enough darts at the dartboard, like something's gonna stick. And so that's inspired my creative process. That's inspired me to do more things that maybe I am more passionate about and maybe are, or even out of my comfort zone. Um, so I would, I would, you know, inspire people to do the same. It's just maybe do something that you didn't think you would do. You might love it. It might create, you know, instill this creativity or this passion in you, you didn't know you had. So, I mean, for me, that's where I get my motivation is just watching Jana and I'm just trying to keep up with her. Yeah, I'm, I kind of feel like I'm like a scrapper. Like I just, you know, I've always kind of fended for myself. I had to, you know, I, I didn't come from a lot of money in my family. So I was like, if I needed a car, I had to buy my own car. If I want this, I have to go out and get it. And so that's just how I've always had my mentality. And, you know, even to this day, I'm like, okay, I have a f- family I have to support. So I'm like, I gotta, I gotta get like, what is it going to be? And so I'm always trying to taking situations and like, okay, how can I turn it now that I'm a mom? How can I brand this or how can I do this or what like what do moms need what do moms want and you know what is what does the singing world need what is it and so I'm just constantly having to create because I mean I have family I gotta I gotta keep hustling for so um and you know they're my main motivation to do that and um yeah so I would just say you know hustle (laughs) and just create well I've said it before a lot of people think that uh Babe Ruth was the greatest home run hitter uh, and when he, of course, set that record back in the day, but he, that same year he was also the strikeout king. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's really about stepping up to the plate, taking a swing. So I agree with you both. Um, uh, talk to me about balancing all of this with being a mom. I mean, it's definitely hard. Um, I actually had a so I also volunteer at um, at church in the in the children's um, uh, nursery. Uh, I'm with the the toddlers, but it was interesting because one of the moms in there, I had to text her and say that we had to move her kid to a different room. And she had texted me yesterday and was like, I finally put two and two together. I didn't realize that you were Jana Kramer. She's like, you know, I've been wanting to volunteer in the nursery for, you know, the past seven years that we've been going to cross point. And she's like, and I've always made an excuse for everything. Why I couldn't do it. Why I didn't have the time to do it. She's like, and then I say, you see you volunteering and going, Oh crap. Well, if she can do it, she's doing a million other things. So my thing is like, you can't make excuses for your life and for the things that you want to do. If you want to start working out, you can make the time, you can find the time to do anything. It's your own psyche, your own brain making excuses why you can't find the time. There's always time. You have 24 hours in a day to find the time. So it's, you just have to, you know, write it out. If you have to find a calendar, see what's more important that day, but you can make the time. You just have to do it. And what, what about from a dad's perspective? Um, I mean, like Jana kind of alluded to earlier, you know, this whole pandemic thing realized or kind of validated that we can do this as parents and work and do the things that we need to do. And for us, it's just communicating, you know, on a greater level of being like, hey, I need five minutes. Hey, I need this. Hey, you know, and just having each other's back in that facet. Um, but it's been fun. I think, you know, it's funny when we, when we go a longer time without being around the kids, it's like we get more annoyed quicker. Like we get, you know, it gets harder quicker, but when we're around them all day, every day for a week straight, we're, you know, we're more tolerable of the things that happen and the things that go on. So 
as a dad, it's just been fun to be around them and be supportive of all the things Jan is doing and be with the kids and just soak in these moments because this isn't going to last forever, right? We're going to get out of this. Things are going to go back to a little bit more of a normal life and we're going to be traveling again and all over the country and doing the things that we do. So we're just really trying to be present in the moment that we have now and use it as a gift. So let's talk about uh, 2021. Let's hope that we have a fresh new start. Mm -hmm. Paint the picture that you hope occurs in your lives in 2021. Um, What's it going to look like? Just healthy balance. Again, like just like real healthy balance, being able to do the things we love and travel and film, you know, film movies, but to be able to really have that time like that we had this year with the kids because it was awesome to be that connected with the kids and to be with them 24 seven, but to have a healthy balance of that in 2021, to be able to work and still travel, but also, you know, make the time for, for the kids obviously. And because that this past year has been amazing because of the kids to be so with them. Mm -hmm. Um, for me in our relationship specifically, it's, uh, to not be on such a roller coaster because over the past, five years that we've been together, there's always been something that typically I've done to cause a big drop, you know, whether it's uh, a discovery, lack of trust, uh, you know, whatever it may be. And so I just, a gift for myself and for Jana and for our family is just where, you know, I don't want to plateau. I still want to keep going up, but there's just no dip down where it's just, and you know, I, I have a lot of shame around that where I just, I'm so exhausted of having to dig myself out of a hole and our relationship out of a hole because of things that I've done that cause such a ripple effect in our relationship and in our family dynamic that I'm, t- I'm tired of, cli- you know, climbing, my, climbing out of these holes. I just want to stay smooth and steady and just continue to climb up as a family, as a man, as a couple and within our marriage. So that's my biggest thing for 2021. It's just nothing, nothing to bring us down. Just all good, all good things. Talk to me about the role of, um, uh, that you brought up church faith plays in, mm-hmm. in your lives. I mean, it's, it's honestly new, um, going to church every Sunday. Uh, obviously the pandemic really set us back, which was a bummer. Cause I felt like we were getting really invested in the church and I was volunteering and he was going to prayer every Tuesday. And so I think it was, that was the negative of the quarantine was because um, I like to, I don't, yeah, we can watch it on online, but for me, I just like being in the church and hearing the music and um, just having like that experience. So um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's new, but we're, you know, we were praying at night with the kids and, you know, we're trying to just bring it into our lives more. And I think it's getting more natural. Um, It's just, I think it's just practice and and just having that faith. And how did that, how did that come about? Um, with just, um, our relationship, um, the last few times, it's just, uh, you know, we kind of sought out talking to our pastor and, um, knowing that we have to have him in our marriage to be able to, um, you know, have faith and believe that, you know, someone else is helping us hold this together because it's kind of hard to do it or just ourselves. Yeah. For years there we try to do it ourselves both individually and and as a couple and after the the last kind of hole that i dug us in you know earlier this year in january it was one of those things just we both just surrendered you know i got rebaptized in february and just which was a jump start for me and for my reconnection with with god and my higher power and and so it's just one of those things we've made the choice to bring him back into our lives. And it was baby steps at first because we both got away from it for, for years there. Even though we both were raised Catholic, I went to church every Sunday, went to Sunday school, got confirmed, you know, confirmed all that stuff. And just over the, the years in my late teens and twenties, I just lost it. And so to be a, you know, over 30 year old male and, you know, Jana the same, um, to bring him back into our life just goes to show that, even for, for middle-aged thirties that it's, it's never too late, let alone someone who's even older than us. So, um, for a long time, I was ashamed that I had lost touch with God and it's just, it is, I mean, he's there for us, you know? And so it's such a fulfilling feeling knowing that we're not alone. 
um, and get the validation from him on a daily basis. Well, I want to thank you too. You, you've been, you've been a lot of fun to have and thank you for the insight and the authenticity. And, uh, I wish you, uh, so much success in the year to come and, uh, Congratulations once again on your New York Times best-selling <laughs> book. Thank, Thank you, you David. so much. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Jana and Michael. Oh, wow. That was some interview. The, you guys are just amazing. Thanks for stopping by the Homestead Studio here. The book is called The Good Fight, Wanting to Leave, Choosing to Stay, and the Powerful Practice of Loving Faithfully. Now, a New York Times bestseller. Highly recommend it. It will help you in your, uh, you know, navigate your relationship. It'll help you get to the other side of whatever you're going through, or it, it, it'll help you improve the, the great relationship you have right now. Nevertheless, it's a great read and you'll have a good time reading it. And I'm sure that you'll relate to a lot of what they have to talk about. Be sure to check out their podcast. It's called wind down w-h-i-n-e down with jana and mike i really like that podcast and i listen to a lot of podcasts but that is that's become one of my favorites well just go check it out i'm not going to say any more than that it, it's fun okay and be sure to share our podcast with your friends and especially on social media because that's the only way they're going to find our podcast is by your sharing it with them you can find all of our episodes by the way at contagiousinfluencers.com, contagiousinfluencers.com, and you'll see a whole slew of episodes that you can uh, sh listen to, that you can share, and please do rate and review us, okay? And also check out our sister radio show, which is called uh, Keep the Faith, and you can check it out at keepthefaith.com and even sample some of our episodes. That's keepthefaith.com. I'm David Sams, and this has been CIA, Contagious Influencers of America, the podcast from the producers of Keep the Faith. And uh, we really appreciate you hanging out with us. And most of all, go out there and live that life and live in living color because it sure is a heck of a lot more interesting than living in black and white. We'll see you next time. <laughs>